Hello, everybody. Um, I am thrilled to be talking to you today about um, the early members of the Society of Women Geographers and uh, why they matter today. Um, it's a picture of me. I wasn't thinking you'd be able to see me on the screen too, so that's me. <laughs> so in, um, in how I got started writing this book, in 2016, I went on a 10-week um, trip to Asia and I traveled throughout China, I relaxed in Thailand, and I spent uh, three weeks in Indonesia um, studying Balinese music, um, gamelan. And then when I returned home, I decided that I needed to write a book about an explorer. So I started doing some research and my research turned up Blair Niles. And I was, a re I was really taken back by how, um, how forward thinking she was. So I started to do some research on her. And I found out she was uh, born on a plantation in 1880, surrounded by freed, freed slaves. Um, two decades earlier, her maternal grandfather um, had provoked the nation into starting the Civil War on behalf of the Confederates. Um, so she had, uh, she had a background of um, racist people in her family, but her mother, who was the daughter of this um, congressman who uh, ended up launching the Civil War with a, a speech, um, her mother had decided that they were too poor to send her, her children to school um, and so that they could get diverse viewpoints. So they, um, she started a night school for Blair and her brothers to expose them to those diverse viewpoints. And she invited all of the plantation's children and neighborhood children. Um, and that struck me as pretty amazing in the 1880s that there would be this night school of black and white children. Uh, the picture you see on the screen is a picture of Blair with her uh, first childhood female friend, um, Millie. And she wrote about Millie in a, in a later book. So Blair is remembered as being um, uh, the author of the first compassionate book on gays in Harlem. Um, she wrote books about brutal treatment of prisoners in uh, French Guiana, where the um, Devil's Island penal colony is, uh, that you might know that from the movie Papillon. Um, she also wrote about the uprisings of slaves in the largest um, slave rev rev revolution, the Haitian Revolution. And she also wrote about um, uh, the mutiny of slaves aboard the slave ship, the Amistad. Um, those things tend to be forgotten today, and I was really compelled by them because she was such a forward-looking woman. Also overlooked is her role in the founding of the Society of Women Geographers. So when I learned about the Society of Women Geographers, and there was this diverse group of women, um, who were early members, I um, expanded my writing to include um, or focus on the founding of the society. I wasn't disappointed because um, these early founding, founding members are every bit as amazing as Blair was. So you know the story. Um, one snowy afternoon, the founders met for tea and first Blair met with Marguerite Harrison and then expanded her group. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the founders, um, focusing on maybe some things that you don't already know about them. So Marguerite Harrison was a journalist turned spy. I like the fact that when she first started working for the Baltimore Sun, she couldn't figure out how to get the typewriter out of the desk because it was one of those flip ones where you flip it over. Um, anyway, she, she 
she volunteered to be a journalist because she wanted to go to um, report on World War I. Um, they refused to send her because she was a woman. And so she contacted the military and became a spy. Uh, she spied on Russia and um, was imprisoned in Lubyanka prison for um, several uh, years. Um, she was released only on the ground that she become a double agent, which she did reluctantly. Um, in, while she was in, um, in, in Europe, she met a man, um, Marion Cooper. Marion Cooper uh, was uh, a pilot and he had been in a down plane. Um, he was talking to her about the um, documentaries and the idea of coming up with this documentary. So they um, collaborated and she actually funded the film. It was a second ethnographic documentary that was ever produced in the United States. Um, Nanook of the North was the first and Grass was the second. It told the story about the migration of the Bakhtiari people in Persia, which is uh, present day Iran, as they guided their families, their sheep, their cows, a uh, half million cows and sheep um, from the Persian Gulf into the cooler mountain ranges uh, in Persia. The guy who was the cameraman would later um, film King Kong. So that I found interesting. The second of the founders was Gertrude Emerson Zen. She led an expedition to Asia in 1921. And she heard about this little man who was uh, causing all kinds of problems there. It turned out it was Gandhi. So she contacted him for um, an interview because she worked for Asia Magazine. Gandhi said, I'll find you a village for you to stay in while you study the people there. Well, when he, um, when they found her a village, she did not like it at all. It was, didn't meet her requirements. And she said, well, I thought I was going to get to pick my own village. And so she found another village and, uh, and uh, they shipped 40,000 bricks over to that village to, so that she could um, create a house, which she did. And um, she ended up spending most of her life in India, writing about the voiceless people of India. Um, Blair is, um, I like these pictures because the ones in the Society of Women Geographer, um, uh, new, the, the annual bulletins always have a terrible picture of Blair, so these are a little bit nicer. Um, she circumnavigated the globe in 1910 with her um, then her then husband William Beebe. They were going on a pheasant expedition for the New York Zoological Society. After their divorce, though, many of the women in the society joined William Beebe. In either working with him or visiting his tropical research stations. One of those was Gertrude Matthews. And Gertrude Matthews, this is the best picture I could find of her, um, she went to visit him on an expedition to British Guiana. Um, she was a feminist ge economic geographer who studied land use and natural resources. And she also studied the Gullah people of uh, South Carolina. Harriet Chalmer Adams, who was the president of the society, um, she believed that white people didn't have a monopoly on greatness. And as a humanitarian, her goal was to dispel many of the um, myths that had led to prejudice against those of Spanish descent. And she was on a mission to visit every country who had ever flown the flag of Spain. Um, later that goal would be interrupted when she was uh, walking on a cliff in the Balearic Islands. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, 
right off the coast of Spain. She fell off the cliff and she broke her back. She had to be transported by ship um, back to the United States where she spent two years in bed recovering. And during that time, she worked on the Society of Women Geographers uh, business and hoped she would again be able to travel, which she did. So these women could have been, they could have started a, a women explorers club, but they didn't. They started the Society of Women Geographers. That was because they wanted to attract a diverse group of women, not just explorers. So when I talk about diversity, obviously we look at this picture and there's some diversity, at least in age, but certainly not in the way we normally think of the word diverse. Um, most of them were white, but they were diverse in other ways, socioeconomic groups, um, educational attainment, marital status, um, sexual orientation, occupation, ethnicity, and nationality. Those all were different. Um, they were an eclectic group of uh, people. They were explorers, artists, musicians, but they all shared common interests born out of their love of travel. Um, during World War I, they sailed to um, Europe to assist the Allies um, long before the United States entered the war. And, and as you read their information, you can tell it was not only their desire to be patriotic, but their love of travel that got them there. They also shared horizons that were broadened by travel experiences that altered their perspectives. Blair Niles viewed travel as a spiritual journey with the object of studying the national soul. She wrote, one of the results of much wandering is undoubtedly to develop in the wanderer as many standards of beauty as there are races. Travel inspired these women to um, celebrate differences and to encourage homebodies to see the world through a different lens. So I'm going to go through some of the the people who were included as early members um, to show the, the diversity of, of geographers that they had. Um, Osa Johnson, who was a filmmaker, uh, Amelia Earhart, pilot, Gloria Hollister, scientist, um, anthropologists like Margaret Mead, um, writers like Pearl S. Buck, who won the Nobel Prize and the Pulitzer Prize, um, mountain climbers like Annie Peck, one of my uh, favorites of those uh, early women geographers, and another early favorite was Malvina Hoffman, who was a sculptor. Also, Frances Desmond, and who was a music ethno ethnocologist, and Teada Fisher, um, a member of the Chickasee tribe who was a storyteller. Most of the early members shared a common interest and had a concern for marginalized groups. And that's what really attracted me to my study of the Society of Women Geographers. Now, you might think, uh, that the society was involved in um, women's issues early on. Of course, suffrage was before the society was created, but many of those early members had been active in suffrage. Um, they, they all seemed to march in parades. Um, this is a, a great picture of Annie Peck there with her strange mask on, um, planting a uh, flag at the top of Mount Coropona in Peru. Um, the woman here standing on the um, platform, uh, might be a carriage, 
uh, is it's Mary Beard. Mary Beard, Mary Ritter Beard, was a um, a um, early member who uh, took an active role in the Congress Congressional Union of um, Women's Suffrage. She was the person who fought for. Um, a federal amendment rather than the state amendments. And I, I want to go back and also say that um, Harriet Chalmers Adams, the president, um, she believed that um, women and men had different interests, not interests, but different perceptions of the world. And that in order to have a complete perception, you had to be able to see both sides. And um, Blair believed that humanity had um, two wings, one woman, one man, and not until both, both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Um, later geographer um, Margaret Edith Trussell would summarize the same thought when she said, how can a discipline realize its full potential while walking on only one leg? So um, these early members did focus on women issues. Uh, this is in the center is um, Grace Thompson Seton, who was active in the Con Connecticut suffrage movement. And she got a rude awakening one time when she was returning from uh, Cuba with her husband who was British. When she got to the port, the US port, she was directed to go to the entrance for foreigners. Um, because by entering the country with her British husband, she became denaturalized and lost her citizenship. So she ended up fighting to give women the right not to be defined by their husband's citizenship. Ella Regal um, was a uh, um, a leader in the Congressional Union of Women's Suffrage and later the National Women's Party. She was known as a silent sen sentinel, an iron jaw angel uh, for her silent protests. So on the left side, you see them silently protesting the White House. Later, they burned the president in effigy and um, were arrested, went to a workhouse um, and then, uh, chartered a train to travel the nation across to California um, to broadcast their unfair treatment in the prison. And that actually did put a lot of press pressure on the president to pass suffrage. So besides women, they were also interested in marginalized groups. Um, several were members of the NAACP, um, Adeline Moffitt, well, was one of them. She was a leader in the Boston NAACP. And um, you see on the left side, the film um, Birth of a Nation came out and she, um, she spoke between, before the Massachusetts le legislature um, to seek censorship of that. On the right, you see Zonia Barber, um, a geologist and geographer, and she was um, in. She was friends with um, Joel Augustus Rogers, who was a black Jamaican American intellectual, and he wrote a book that attacked the myth of the Negro inferiority and highlighted the. Um, accomplishments of black men. So um, she invited him to her house. This was in the like, around 1915 to speak to her students. Um, she taught at a Chicago college. She to speak to her students to get them to um, understand um, difficulties with racism. And, um, and here she's pictured teaching a class at the Hampton Institute in Virginia. Um, Ellen Lamott, uh, she was a gay woman who was a nurse and she was um, from Baltimore. She was returning from um, Europe where she had been studying militant tactics 
suffrage tactics um, in uh, England when World War II broke out while she was returning on the ship. And she immediately decided she had to go back and, um, and help the wounded um, in um, World War I. She returned and worked at a, a hospital in Belgium. She was having difficulty with her feelings about um, the conditions that the, the um, uh, soldiers were in and the, and the people who volunteered for the war who really did it sort of as a, so they could say at cocktail parties, I went to Europe and helped uh, fight against the allies. Um, and she didn't like that. So she, um, she wrote this book, it's called Backwash of War. And in it, she unflinchingly writes about um, the war and the, the um, conditions of these wounded soldiers, the stench of the operating room uh, permeated that her stories um, that the book was later was shortly um, censored because it was so negative about um, the condition of the wounded. But it is regarded as one of the best books on World War I. Uh, Blair visited um, French Guiana, uh, the penal colony there, met with uh, prisoners there, spoke to them, lived on the, the uh, island for a while, lived among the prisoners, and wrote a book that eventually um, was turned into a film, and both the book and the film helped pressure the French government to close the prison. Um, while, while she was writing that book, though, she also wrote about same-sex relationships between prisoners, and um, and as a result of that, um, she, she was emboldened by the fact that she could publish this book that talked so candidly about this issue. She decided when the Great Depression hit that she was gonna go to Harlem and study gays there. So she, she went um, and wrote the first compassionate book about gays and, and also the first book that discussed police profiling against gays. So while Blair's studying uh, these gay men in Harlem and writing about them, um, Malvina Hoffman um, had an opportunity to, uh, to, to memorialize all the races of the world for the field Museum. This was at a time when um, a lot of scientists and a lot of members of the society were rushing to uh, study Aboriginal cultures, fearing, fearing that imperialism and racism would doom those cultures to extinction. Margaret Mead said, the work of recording these unknown ways of life had to be done now or they would be lost forever. That's what she thought in the 1920s. Um, so, um, uh, at, during that same time, Frances Desmond, Desmore, um, the ethnomusicologist, she transcribed 2,400 um, Indian songs for the Smithsonian, um, but Malvina, Hoffman was given this opportunity to not just memorialize one quote dying culture, but all of them when the Field Museum hired her to um, do bronze sculptures, many, all of them life size, or many of them life size. Um, um, she had to sculpt 100 statues in in statues in, in maybe a year and a half. She traveled around the world to do that. I included the picture on the right because I love this picture. The woman with the baby on her back, um, it, it just goes to show that the, um, even the experts could disagree on physical characteristics of these um, races. 
she said of that woman, you can't really see her butt right now, but um, that's the point of the picture, um, including the picture. She got so many um, conflicting opinions on the buttocks of that woman that she, she joked that she was going to make it into rubber and then she could put more air in it or less air in it, um, depending on which, ethno uh, which um, anthropologist was expected to view the museum. These are beautiful works of art, um, later criticized as being racist themselves, but uh, my opinion is she was not racist as she did that. Um, there were challenges too. Uh, Mary Ritter Beard um, devoted most of her, her um, life as, as a historian, she, reminding people of women's contributions. Um, she wanted to show that women's contributions, even though they um, were often ignored, they had been central to the advancement of the human race. Um, the problem wasn't that women had failed to develop their wings, um, but that women's achievements were often overlooked. And her motto was no documents, no history. So she, um, she dedicated her, her career to overcoming this problem and really is the, uh, the reasons that we have women's uh, history being taught in colleges today. One of the reasons that women are often not prominently featured in history is because they're often erased. And this is a picture of Matilda Gage, who came up with this concept that was later coined as the Matilda effect. Um, she, in 1883, um, wrote about all the contributions that women had made that were ignored. Um, they came up with the baby carriage, for example, and uh, um, uh, another example she gave was Eli Whitney, um, the supposed inventor of the cotton gin. Um, turned out he actually made that cotton gin according to the specifications of a woman who invented it, but didn't want to claim credit for such an unmanly uh, activity. So later, scientist Margaret Rossiter came up with this idea of the Matilda effect to describe a cognitive bias that blots out the achievement of women in society. Many of the early members of the society were subject to the Matilda effect. <clears throat> One of them was Margaret Mead. Um, five years after her death, Derek Friedman, Freeman, a uh, Australian, uh, attacked her work uh, with the, uh, the the work she did on the Samoan people, and many people um, found his attack of Margaret to be unsubstantiated and cowardly, especially since it was after her death. Uh, one of his colleagues said that Freeman seemed to have a special hell, place in hell reserved for Margaret Mead for reasons that were not clear to him at the time. Um, I could give you lots of other examples, but I wanna get to the end of this. Um, <clears throat> today, um, women continue to be discredited and intact, and an example is on Wikipedia. 18% of biographical um, entries on Wikipedia about women, 18%. Of those, 80% are stubs, which means undeveloped. Um, and 70,000 notable women uh, do not have Wikipedia entries. So uh, women are also more likely to be deleted than men. And there are examples of, of um, the editors deleting biographical entries of women that they just don't feel are supported. Um, there have been organizations uh, that hold these edit-a-thons edit in order to um, increase women's Wikipedia profiles. 
based on the idea that if it's not on Wikipedia, it doesn't exist, and that these women need to be written back into history. So with that in mind, I decided to um, rewrite Blair Niles' um, Wikipedia entry. Um, and so um, I, I did that a couple months ago. It hasn't been deleted, that's a good thing. Um, and I hope that more of these um, Wikipedia entries um, will be edited. I'm, I'm going to make it a mission of mine to, um, to edit the ones of the geogra women geographers who I profiled in my book. Um, and I hope that you will join me in that endeavor. Um, and this is a copy of my book and website. Um, the book's going to be published by Sourcebook, which Mary indicated is the largest uh, uh, publish, woman-owned publisher in the United States. So I'm thrilled about that. And um, that's my um, presentation.